everybody for, for joining in. Um, I know we've had a, a bit of a wonky schedule in, in November uh, with Halloween, um, which is usually a, a high holy day for us at the, at the Historical Society. Um, so we're, we're glad you, you've joined in today. Um, our speaker today is John Fielding, who's the curator of the Anthracite Heritage Museum and Eckley Miners Village. Um, John will be speaking about anthracite photographers. Um, so much of our history is anthracite based. Um, and most of what we rely on to help illustrate that um, was a series of photos taken by very few individuals um, who we hold near and dear to our hearts. Um, so John, I will, I will turn it over to you. All right, well, thanks, thanks everybody for, for joining in today. And uh, thanks Sarah and Marianne for inviting me to present. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the anthracite photographers um, uh, of this region and I'm going to focus on some of the some of the main anthracite photographers, particularly John Horgan Jr., Watson Bunnell, George Harvin, and Scott Herring. Uh, there are other anthracite photographers. Some people would say George Brett, uh, William Ra. Um, I'm going to. I'm it's kind of a work in progress for me. So uh, the more I got looking at some of these earlier photographers like Brett and Ra. Um, some of the earlier ones who did a lot of these stereoscopic views like Sturch and Ogilvy and uh, Beckwith. Um, you know, I, there's, there's just a lot of information. Um, so I, in order to condense it down, I'm going to focus on the time period from, from Horgan Bunnell all the way to Scott Herring. And um, those other ones that I've mentioned before, the really early ones, a lot of the research uh, for them, you know, is because of uh, actually uh, Dr. Healy and uh, other um, other scholars, particularly Dr. Healy and, and Charlie Petrillo. So uh, I'm glad, you know, uh, that Richard Healy could actually join us today. Uh, but th I think those earlier ones could be, uh, really could have their own, um, their, their own presentation because they're, they're kind of unique in, in that sense. But I'm going to focus on uh, John Horgan Jr., Watson Bunnell, George Harvin, and Scott Herring for today. And I kind of divided them up into um, different topics. So Horgan and Bunnell represent this recordation slash documentation era of the anthracite industry. Whereas Harvin and Herring kind of represent a social cultural heritage documentation uh, of the industry. And it, in examining their photographs, um, you can really see that there's, there's this uh, kind of a stark difference. So what do I mean by recordation and documentation? So Bunnell and um, Harvin or Horgan, they document the rise of the anthracite industry. They're both, um, you know, really begin photographing sometime in the 1890s, but early 1900s, they document this rise through, you know, the 1900s, teens, and into the 20s. So the industry is going up, it's increasing. Uh, there's new technology being developed. Their main purpose, however, was really to document for corporate insurance and corporate valuation purposes. Their secondary purpose was educational slash instructional. Both of them, uh, Bunnell and, and Horgan, they you know, did take images that were included in various um, instructional pamphlets by their various companies. So, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Both of them, though, have a minimal focus on the human element, unless that was for scale or demonstration purposes. And, and their, their human element was often posed to shots. And technology at the time kind of plays into that as well, because the cameras weren't, weren't as good. But um, so we'll get into a little bit more of that. They do, though, they have left this legacy kind of a passive preservation by identifying landscapes, the structures, the mining tools and equipment. So at the time they were taking these, these images of a lot of these breakers, a lot of the collieries, you know, we now know today as historians and people studying the past, we can see what, uh, you know, the past actually looked like. 
it, however, when they were taking these documents or these photographs for documentation purposes for insurance or, uh, you know, evaluations, assessments, I, I highly doubt, you know, in their mind that they were, you know, you know, people a hundred years from now were actually going to be looking at, at these uh, photographs. So in the really 1930s and 40s, the anthracite industry starts to uh, ebb. And except for a brief um, increase in production and employment during the World War II era. So, you know, we get this decline of the anthracite industry and the railroading industry in uh, the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then comes in, you know, George Harvin and Scott Herring. So they're kind of documenting the decline of the industry. And their main purpose uh, really was to uh, document the uh, cultural heritage. And it's more of a conscious between Harvin and um, Herring to document this cultural or preserve this cultural heritage by taking photographs. And I, if you listen um, to, uh, I've, I've interviewed and talked with Scott Herring a lot and, and he's very vocal about, you know, this culture, um, it needs to be documented. It needs to be, in his mind, preserved. So he kind of acts as a, uh, I want to say, a cultural anthropologist who studies a culture by taking their photographs almost. So the secondary purpose of Harvin and uh, Oregon, though, is, is corporate documentation, more so for Harvin than, than, than Herring. And there is a very strong focus on the human element uh, within the photographs. And both of them can associate a lot of uh, humanistic stories behind each individual photograph. And there was a professor back in the 1990s named uh, Thomas Dublin, and he did an oral history with uh, George Harvin. And a lot of the stories associated with particular photographs were because of uh, the series of oral history interviews that uh, Professor Dublin did with George Harvin. And that's how we can document, you know, who these people were in these photographs, where it was taken, and why uh, Harvin even took these photographs. Unfortunately, a lot of that was lost with, you know, Horgan and Bonnell. So that personal element, the stories behind the photographs are, are lost, unless it was uh, written down at the bottom as some photographs are. So, Herring is the same way. Her Scott Herring, he's still around. He's still very active. And he has a story, literally a story behind every single photograph, at least every one that, that I've seen that he's talked to me about. And um, he, he really does focus and he knows the people within the photographs. So they have, Herring and Harvin have this legacy of taking pictures almost as a photo documentary oral history. And they add to the recordation and documentation of the industry because even though it's declining, they're still taking pictures of the people, but they're also taking pictures of the structures that were there and are no longer there. So as the industry ebbed, they're taking pictures of those people who still mine, but they're also documenting those structures that have since been removed in the last 50, 60 years. So we're gonna start with recordation. And so the first photographer I'm gonna highlight, and I'm just gonna gloss over a lot of their um, biographical information, but uh, is John Horgan Jr. He was born in 1859 in Rochester, New York. And you know, he took up photography and by 1879, he was working for the Union uh, View Company, which was also in Rochester. And the Union View Company was a company that made stereoscopic views for uh, educational purposes. And, edu and stereoscopic views, you know, these photographers would go out, take pictures of um, a variety of subjects, but often they had a, a typical theme and they become part of a series of stereoscopic views that a uh, an individual could then purchase the whole series 
and view them. And it was sort of an entertainment, uh, you know, something that was entertaining for Victorians, but also educational at the same time. So after uh, working for about five to 10 years with the Union View Company, uh, Horgan finds himself moving to Birmingham, Alabama by 1889. And he's there for a number of years. Some sources uh, say 1893, some say 1894, 1895. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a, a, a mixed bag. It's, it's a circuit date, I guess you could say. So while he was in Birmingham, though, he did establish his own studio. So now he's an independent photographer and largely takes portrait photographs. But he's also uh, hired by various companies down there to take photographs of the iron and, uh, and steel works and then the mining operations down there as well. And that kind of, at that point in time, it solidifies him or at least starts him on this track of being a corporate uh, photographer. So by 1893, between 1893 and 1894, or 1904, he's got various jobs in, in different locations throughout um, the world, including uh, Mexico and Ecuador. And then before he finally permanently settles in, in Scranton, PA. So he came to Scranton in, in 1904, established a shop, then uh, actually left um, again for Mexico. Uh, where he took pictures of the Lelouz uh, Mining Company. And I'll show you some of those later on. So he settles and comes back to Scranton in 1905. And between 1905 and his death in 1926, he um, is the official Delaware and Hudson Company photographer. So this is a picture also of uh, John Horgan Jr., by the way, in his, uh, in his, dark room studio actually in Ecuador. And uh, he was employed for about a year, maybe a year and a half in Ecuador in the late 1890s, early 1900s, and taking photographs of the uh, construction of the uh, Guayaquil and Quito uh, railway. So it was one of the uh, major railways in um, Ecuador connecting their two uh, largest cities. So here's Here's some images from Horgan. And uh, these are all from uh, our collection, the Anthracite Heritage Museum collection. And you, know, you can see in, in a lot of these, they're, they're very, um, especially the landscape, they're, they're very wide angle photographs. And one of the reasons why is he wanted to capture him and, and later on we'll see, uh, look at Bunnell, uh, but he wanted to capture the entire view. So, in, in a lot of their, uh, um, Horgan and Bunnell, a lot of their photographs, one thing that you'll notice is that, especially landscapes, there are a lack of, of people. But you get this, um, I guess you could say, recordation of what was going on at the time. So, this one over here, the, the top one uh, says Colebrook Hudson Coal Company. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can zoom in on this one. So if you look at it, um, really it, it's a little town scene. There's several different houses. And what happened was there was a cave-in underneath the mine and uh, he had to go out and actually photograph this, this mine cave for insurance purposes. You can kind of see there's some of the houses may have had some damage in the background and, you know, the coal company would have been partially responsible for some of that uh, damage. So they may have had to file an insurance claim. <clears throat> and, but there's no people in, in that photograph, but you still get this sense looking at it today of what was happening, uh, the way people lived, how the landscape actually looked in the region. And that helps us uh, today kind of studying the past. One of the things that um, Horgan did that I, I don't know if he gets really enough credit for 
is this photograph over here is the Marvin Breaker uh, actually being built. So um, we have actually a, in, in our collection a, at least 50 photos of various uh, points of its construction. And John Horgan Jr., when it was being built, set up about 12 or 13 stations around the construction site of the Marvin uh, Breaker being built. And you can see it, um, you know, the progression of its construction over the period of about a year and a half as it's being built. So it's one of the most complete photographic documentations of a, of a breaker construction. And you can have blueprints. And blue, blueprints are pretty cool, but the photographs actually, you know, they, they add really that three-dimensional uh, feel to it. And you can see it coming to, uh, to fruition. And you can actually see in some cases um, how it was built. So the blueprints might tell you one thing, but how it was built might tell you something else through the photograph. And if we go down over here, mm -hmm. We have the Marvin Breaker as it was finally constructed. And um, if you look at the date here, it says 1920. Uh, uh, Horgan, he kind of, uh, I think he kind of made a mistake because it's supposed to be 1921. Um, <laughs> so I think he got kind of confused. So sometimes they did label things wrong. But most of the time, you know, by labeling the stuff, it helps us as historians really identify what was going on and when something was built, which can also help us date uh, tools and equipment that uh, the miners used themselves in the technology. So I'm going to escape out of that. Now, if we look at the two uh, images where the miners are working, we have one up top here that Oregon took. This one and the one kind of catty corner to it that I have, they're more for instructional purposes. So once again, the human element is not the primary focus of Oregon. It's more for documentation. This photograph documenting to uh, show how to properly load a mine car. So you can see how it's, it's being topped off. There was a proper way to top off a mine car so that the miner could get paid. And that, you know, so that they uh, could do that. And then up top here, there's another photograph. These show miners going in and uh, they're, they're actually checking in for the day, taking their tag. So properly checking in and getting their, uh, their safety lamps. So it's showing how to properly do that. And it's also documenting for insurance purposes that the company makes their employees do that. So that, you know, if anything happened, workman's compensation, uh, when Horgan and Bono were taking these photographs, it was kind of important. Uh, the company could say to an insurance company, yes, you know, we are employees, you know, they know how to do this. We train them. The DL and W and the Hudson Coal Company in the, especially in the teens and twenties were actually very proactive in uh, creating safety um, programs for their employees to reduce mine accidents. And they were two of the pioneering companies for um, health and safety, uh, you know, within anthracite mines. And, you know, some of these images, particularly the one that I'm on right now and the one I just showed you, they were also used in pamphlets by these companies, maybe not during Horgan's lifetime, but later on after, after he passed away um, in safety pamphlets demonstrating, you know, the proper technique. These are some of his images too from the West End Coal Company. Um, a lot of people, uh, they haven't seen these uh, yet. So uh, I like to share them with, with everybody. But once again, you can see that uh, these, this is another coal company that 
hired John Horgan Jr. At, to basically photo document for insurance purposes their uh, mining operations. And as you can see, the exterior photographs are often wide angle because he was trying to capture the entire view that he saw. And uh, even the interior uh, of the uh, Golden Drift over on the, the extreme left-hand side here, that, that is wide angle as well. But once again, the hu human aspect is not very uh, apparent. And even in the Little Italy uh, photo down here in the center, you don't really have this, you know, human element, even though there are people. When I zoom in, you can see uh, off to, you know, the, uh, the kind of the right that there are people, a, a group of people standing in front of the, the patch town. No, and, simply Amish. Right. And the, the patch town itself, you know, in Little Italy, as well as the one, oops, wrong slide, as well as the one up top up here, and other, more company houses in Makanaqua. They, um, there's no people in these photographs. It's because they were for documentation insurance purposes. So West End Coal Company was located in Makanaqua, by the way, which is just across uh, the Susquehanna River from Shikshini. So uh, in case anybody's wondering where, where it was. Mm -hmm. But the images themselves, they give us a good sense of what the town looked like, what the living conditions were like for the employees, and even the landscape. So Shikshini, you go to Shikshini Makanakwa today, and particularly this image right here of the West, and coal company uh, company houses. This is uh, what is Railroad Street in Makanakwa. And it, it hasn't really changed much. It, it really hasn't. And you can actually see, you know, from this vantage point near the mountains and, and the river, uh, some of these houses aren't there anymore. They've been really remodeled. But you can tell, at least from this photograph, that uh, the road you're on today, it, is, is the same thing when you drive through uh, Makanaqua. Now, just a little south, uh, or actually it would be north of Makanaqua is, is the breaker. And you can see this is the West End Coal Company breaker, maybe about half a mile south, maybe half a mile, three quarters of a mile south of uh, what is now the town of Makanaqua. And there's comb banks in the background and those, some of those comb banks are actually still there today. And uh, they've been either added to or, or taken away a little bit over the years, but some of those banks are still there. So it, you know, that, that historical landscape in and of itself is still being preserved and we can see it in its original form in, uh, through Oregon and later on, I'll show you some of Bono's photographs. So these are just some of uh, Horgan's photographs from when he was uh, actually in Mexico uh, working for the Luz Mining Company. So not very many people um, have ever seen these photographs. And uh, they published, there was a book published in uh, 2010 that actually contained uh, the bulk of his uh, photographs from the Luz Mining Company. And um, I guess, you know, it's kind of one of those weird things, like no, nobody knew that uh, really he had been in Mexico. Um, <laughs> so it was one of those forgotten uh, parts of his career. And until this, this book was uh, actually discovered, and then uh, and it was discovered actually by accident in a, uh, in a flea market in Mexico. So, um, so Horgan's legacy, you know, was partly, you know, it, it's, it's more than just an anthracite legacy. He does, you know, have this legacy in, in Mexico, uh, Alabama, and in, in Ecuador. But you can see his photographs, at least the two along the, the edge here, they show some of the mining operations in, in Mexico at the time. And it was, it was uh, ore mining, kind of like, a, I think, an iron mine. And let me see the image up on top. That's the, uh, you know, 
the the shaft, the elevator shaft, where they're they're bringing people or supplies up and down. Uh, down below, there's our ore uh, pickers, so they're sorting ore out, so the the stones from the actual ore, sort of like uh, slate pickers, uh, would have been in, in the anthracite industry. Most of his stuff, as I said before, he it takes a lot of his photographs with a wide angle so that you get to see the entire view that he's seeing. And it's more for documentational purposes. Some of the photographs that he took when he was with the Luz Coal Company, uh, I think he kind of took maybe for his own purposes and maybe as a tourist when he went to uh, Mexico. And same thing with, with Ecuador. Because, you know, some of the, them kind of break away from his more traditional stuff that we see up here. And he focuses on some of the, the, the people within the photographs, such as the one with the uh, two women uh, making tortillas. And if you notice down at the bottom of that one, he also signs it Horgan, photo Scranton PA. So this at this point in time, even though he had been in Scranton for just a couple months before leaving to go to Mexico, he still signs it, Oregon of Scranton. So here's uh, just a couple more of his photographs to give you just an idea of some more things that he did throughout his career. The top one over here, this is the uh, main hall of the Waverly Community House. And uh, if you notice down at the bottom, he just signs it, Oregon, and he has a number on it. So at some point in Horgan's career, he stops um, signing at Horgan of Scranton and he assigns everything a number. The one slightly below right here, this is one of his earliest photographs that he took when he was in Ecuador uh, working for the uh, Guayaquil and Quito Railway. And um, if you notice, down at the bottom, he just has a number, so it's not even um, identified. And that, that's one of those things, um, you know, him and Bunnell, sometimes they, they put their, their names on it. Sometimes they'll put um, just an initial. And that's, that's kind of how we can identify it. Um, but early on, Horgan just wrote some numbers uh, or just, in some cases, put his name. So this is a uh, Quito or Guayaquil and Quito Railway. It shows uh, some engineers at the time uh, going up a, a cliff face uh, to do a, a survey while they were building that railroad. The slightly um, macabre image next to it is uh, actually the, the death photo of um, the outlaw and train robber, Rube Burroughs. And I don't know if anybody knows who Rube Burroughs was, but uh, in the late 1880s, early 1890s, he was a um, really identified by some uh, some law enforcement agents as he as almost as notorious as uh, um, you know some of the like Billy the Kid or um, some of the other more famous uh, train robbers, and he robbed trains in uh, Alabama, Louisiana. Arkansas and and even Texas and um, he finally met his match one day and, and died in a shootout in uh, I believe it was in Texas so they sent him back to uh, they sent his body back to Alabama where he was born and when it arrived at Birmingham I guess they unloaded it and Horgan was one of the first uh, photographers on the scene to start taking pictures and uh, that was actually very customary at the time. And they eventually, um, you know, those, those photographs appeared in newspapers. And it, it actually, at the time, made Horgan kind of famous uh, because of that, that image. The next image, you know, this is another one of his Birmingham images. And it shows some, uh, I, I guess at the time, they, they were migrant workers or tenant farmers uh, working on a, a large farm at the time. Um, I'm not sure what they were, were picking, uh, but they have, you know, you can see they're, they're clearly harvested something with uh, the large uh, sacks 
that they have. It might be tobacco. I'm not really sure what, what it is. But it's actually one of the few images that I've ever seen. And it doesn't come across clear here, but it says Horgan uh, Binghamton down at the bottom. The next photographer is Watson Bunnell. And um, Bunnell is actually the, the man holding the bicycle in this photograph. So this is a picture of Watson Bunnell and his family uh, at, their, um, at the family homestead in Overfield Township in Wyoming County, about 1900. So Overfield Township, uh, Wyoming County is where Watson Bunnell was born in 1871. And uh, he picks up photography uh, as, a, as a young adult, moves to Scranton. And by 1905, he is really the primary photographer for the DL and W Railroad. And um, so in 1912, the DL and W, they start this safety series. Um, as I said before, the Hudson Coal Company and the DL and W were very proactive with mine safety. So they started this, this safety series, at least the DLNW did, uh, which resulted in a, a booklet that was published called Mine Accidents and Their Prevention. So Bunnell was kind of hired for this series as well to take how-to photographs of miners uh, properly doing different tasks. So how to check for check a mine for gas, you know, the, the explosive gases, how to uh, properly light a fuse, how to properly um, how to properly test the roof and things like that. So he was hired to take photographs showing miners how to uh, do this. About 200 photographs is what he took and not all of them were used. I think about 50 or 60 of them were used. So um, it was an educational uh, pamphlet teaching miners how to do their job more safely. Um, he retired from the DLNW in 1919, but continued to take photographs, you know, throughout the rest of his life for the company. And after uh, Oregon died in 1926, he also took some photographs for the Hudson Coal Company. So um, I know there are some people who, you know, they, they look at a photograph and they go, well, that can't be a bundle because that's Hudson. Well, sometimes, sometimes it is a bundle with the Hudson because um, he did, after Horgan passed away, take some photographs. And he usually dated them um, in, you know, he usually would write on the bottom, you know, 1927 or 1928, something like that. So, but he did take photographs for the Hudson Coal Company as well. He, Bunnell himself, took a lot of photographs. And for a variety of different companies. He took um, photographs not only for the DLNW, for the Hudson, he took uh, photographs for the uh, German coal company, for the uh, Grand Tunnel Coal Company in West Nanticoke, for the Suffolk Anthracite Coal Company in Avoca. So he, he, he kind of uh, had a lot of, a lot of different jobs. But once again, like Horgan, <laughs> like Horgan, his images, um, you know, reflect this more documentation. So there, there are a lot of them are wide angle photographs, especially the exterior landscape shot. And, you know, even, even the one uh, up in the upper right corner here. So even, even this one from the Grand Tunnel Coal Company, it's, it's really documentation purposes. So he was hired by the Grand Tunnel Coal Company, just like he was hired by the DL and W, to take insurance purpose photographs, documenting their mine workings for really insurance purposes. The uh, Suffolk Coal Company, same way. Uh, a lot of these pictures were post. Oops. Mm. So, when we, the sepia one that I have over here, the man with the uh, pneumatic drill, that was a posed photograph. Um, I'm assuming it was a posed photograph because if he was actually using that drill, if it was going, there would be so much dust uh, in the air that he probably couldn't get a photograph of it. Uh, you, you wouldn't be able to see the, the, the man in that, that photo. So that was a posed photograph. The photograph in the center, 
that was supposed to be part of the, uh, the series that I was telling you about, um, mine accidents and air prevention. That's actually titled um, Testing the Roof for, for Mine Gas. So you, know, you can see it's a posed photograph. The, the, the gentleman in that photograph is testing the roof and he's got his safety lamp up close to the roof testing it for um, mine gas. And he was supposed to do that as a miner you know, before uh, he entered his area and started, um, started working, started blasting the coal. One of the, one of the only photographs that I've run across from either Horgan or, or Bonnell that actually has the uh, miner fully identified. Some of Horgan's photographs actually have first names, but um, one, the only photograph that I've come across that has the miner fully identified first and last name is the one with the gentleman with the mules at the bottom here. And I think a lot of people have seen this photograph. It's, it's kind of a, a, a nice kind of candid shot as well. So it's one of the few candid shots of miners that, you know, between bundle and photograph that I've ever seen. And actually, I think it's the only candid shot um, that they took of a, of a miner. And this miner, his name is Morgan Williams. And the mules are uh, Dick and Maggie. And this is at the uh, 109th Field Artillery Armory's um, annual horse show. Oh, in 1919. So this is at the Kingston uh, 109th Field Artillery Armory. And uh, so he has this identified. So this was kind of right before Bunnell uh, retired, actually. One of the things, too, with this photograph, and as I, I was saying before, how Horgan and Bunnell also identify uh, their, their photographs. If you look at the bottom, very closely in small print, you can see there's there's a bundle over there, but bundle also numbered them, but he used an H, H and then a number. And sometimes Horgan and bundle photographs do get confused because of that that H. Sometimes bundle did not put his name, and he just put H and whatever that number is. And Horgan would later also do the same thing. So sometimes they get those photographs do get confused. Here's some uh, exterior images of oh, um, yeah. the uh, various coal workings. Uh, the top one is the mill barn at the uh, for the German coal company in uh, in German Pennsylvania, wow. and we have to the right is a washery next to the Susquehanna River. Uh, that's the washery for the Grand Tunnel Coal Company in West Nanticoke. And then we have uh, construction going on at Concrete City. Uh -huh. But once again, you know, I'm going to say that these were for uh, insurance purpose pictures, getting the total uh, view in, the viewpoint in, the vantage point in. And if you look at them, I mean, the mule barn, there's not even mules out, out in the uh, yard. <laughs> and above ground mules, they would have been, some of them would have been put out into pasture for feed as well. Um, the Grand Tunnel Coal Company, that image, you can see that there's a, a church kind of up on the hillside. There's some mining uh, houses uh, just adjacent from the uh, railroad tracks, but there, there aren't any people. There's not even uh, really any movement with the with the trains or anything as well. They're just there to document uh, what it looked like, or as I said again, um, insurance evaluation purposes. However, it does give us this this good sense of what the scenery was like uh, historically, so that they are valuable historical images. The Concrete City one is interesting too, because as the official photographer for the DL and W, he would have been responsible for um, documenting, like Horgan was responsible for documenting the construction of the Marvin Breaker. Uh, Bunnell, you know, would have been responsible for documenting the construction of Concrete City. 
So this is a uh, concrete city before anybody moved in. And uh, I'd say maybe 19, around 1914. And before anybody moved in. And um, it's one of the only images of concrete city that you can see like the entire landscape uh, around it. So this is kind of a, um, a, a unique concrete city image as well, which helps us understand more about what was going on at the time in the landscape. So uh, now I'm gonna kind of shift gears and we're gonna talk more about cultural and social heritage documentation with the last two uh, anthracite photographers. So one of the things that separates uh, Harvin and Herring from the, uh, the previous two photographers is that, you know, Harvin and, and Herring, they really, and you can see it in their photographs, they do focus more on the person or group of people in their images. And that's, that's really, I think it has a lot to do with because they were both born and, and raised in the anthracite region. And they were, you know, Harvin, uh, he, he did take images um, for a PR firm, and we'll get to that a little bit later. So he was paid to take these images uh, early on in his career of miners in the Panther Valley. But Harvin and, and Herring, you know, I think it's because they were born in the region, uh, they had uh, ancestors who were miners. Uh, in both cases, I think their parents, uh, their fathers, for miners for a while. And I think that it was that personal connection uh, with, you know, the industry growing up in the region and with the people of the region that their photographs become less um, documentational in terms of structures and more uh, humanistic, more personalized. So George Harvin, he was born in 1921 in Lansford, Pennsylvania. And he um, really didn't take hold of photography until he entered the military in uh, World War II. So during World War II, he learns how to take photographs uh, through the military. He serves in the, uh, the Pacific Theater. So he eventually ends up in Japan at the end of the war. Um, he's in occupied Japan uh, until the end of 1946 when he's discharged. So I think another thing too is, and we'll get into this a little bit later, some of his photography is, it captures a lot of emotion. And um, that I think may have been because of his, uh, his presence, I guess, uh, in experiences during World War II. So a lot of his, his images are he's very good at capturing you know the human emotion within a lot of these photographs and <clears throat> which really does set him apart from uh the previous photographers so while he's in world war ii uh and while he's in the military i should say he's taking official photographs for the military and then he's also taking images um with his own camera this, uh, this is a picture of George Harvin, by the way, uh, while he was uh, in the military uh, during World War II. And the camera that he's holding uh, is a speed graphic camera. And that, that was his own camera, not, not a military issued camera. He would use the speed graphic camera, this particular type, into uh, the 1960s. And then he, he also used a variety of other cameras throughout his career as well. But it was with his personal camera that he took a lot of candid shots of um, what was going on, like some GIs during World War II, you know, relaxing, you know, uh, you know, playing games, that kind of stuff. He would also take images of, you know, what was going on in the streets of, I think he was stationed in Tokyo. So there's a lot of images of Tokyo at the time. And oddly enough, you, you don't really think about it, but in our collection, we do have about, um, I would say close to 300 images of Horgan or Harvin's 
uh, World War II, his Japanese uh, images. So after he gets discharged uh, from the military, he comes back to Pennsylvania. He ends up getting a job working for a PR firm, uh, taking photographs of the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company's mining operations in the Panther Valley. It's, um, there's two sets of photographs, like the military photographs, there's two sets of photographs with these. There's the official uh, Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company photographs, and then there's the photographs that he took behind the scenes, I guess you could say, the unofficial photographs. And they're more candid. They're, you know, you see these images now of the first time of, of miners uh, relaxing, miners joking around. So it tells a, a different type of story than the story that Horgan and, and Bunnell um, were telling. He, after the Lee I. Cole Navigation Company uh, kind of ceased mining operations around 1954. Uh, a lot of the mines, well, their mines closed, but they reopened under independent, well, some of them reopened under independent uh, mining company. One of them was the Lance Cole Company, who kind of took over the number nine mine. And uh, in the 1960s and 70s, Harvin was, went back and, you know, really, he, he knew a lot of these, these miners from the uh, Lee I. Cole Navigation Company days. So he, he came back to them, knew these, these guys, established the relationships with them, friendships with them. Some of these friendships would last, um, you know, their entire lives. And so he was able to immerse himself in, into the work and the lives of the miners themselves, and even into the community. So Harvin unlike Bunnell and um, Horrigan. Harvin does go out and photographs uh, a bunch of uh, mining photographs, you know, what's going on in the mines, the, the mining structures themselves, but he's also photographing the uh, regional scenes and celebrations, and even in some cases, uh, the home life of, of some of these miners. And so how, how did he do all this? How did he, could he, could he afford to take all these photographs? Uh, he was doing the photography out of pure interest, pure love of documenting the region. But after he left the PR firm in the 1950s, he started working at Bethlehem Steel. And he worked there until his retirement in the photography department until 1984 when he retired. And he had a boss for a period of time who was very, um, very supportive of what he was doing, uh, his, his photography work. Some of his photography work was very artistic and some of it uh, was social and cultural documentation, like what, what he's doing with the uh, miners in the Panther Valley. And his, his supervisor was very um, supportive of that. So as long as he was getting his work done, for Bethlehem Steel, his boss pretty much let him have free reign to go and document what was going on in this case in Lance Cole. So the, the next slide that I have, these are some of his photographs that he took while he was with the Lehigh Cole Navigation Company. And there's two distinct sets here. And I'll kind of zoom in on this one, this one, and the one adjacent. They're both kind of official photographs uh, that were used by the Lehigh Coal Navigation Company to uh, actually as covers for that corporation's annual reports during the 1950s. These were company sanctioned photographs. The remaining images uh, on this page were not uh, company sanctioned photographs, um, particularly the one up in the corner over here of the men in the, uh, in the writing down in, in the cars. So <laughs> you can see there's, compared to Bunnell and, and, and Horgan, and even um, some of the, those before them, this photograph's really different. Uh, it's even different from the one adjacent to it. They're, 
they are um, your focus as the viewer is now on those miners. It's not on the entire trip coming down. It's on just a core group of miners. And this was taken, I think uh, Harvin dated it like around 50, 51. So these are miners coming down into the mine uh, to start their shift. Uh, it's, he titles it man trip. It's, well, that's what it is. So the men are coming down on the trip of cars. They're uh, going to start their day. And in a way, it's sort of an artistic photograph. He's not taking it from a uh, straight on position. It's not documentation. You don't see how many cars there are. There's uh, a, clearly a car behind the one that's in focus, but you can't really see it. You, know, you see the, the lights of the men in the car. There's a car in front. You can kind of tell it's, um, there's, it's coupled and you would assume that there's some type of uh, group of men there. But he wants you to focus on this particular group of men. And he kind of, you know, he's taking it off angle. And so that you really only see, in some cases, from their nose up. And uh, I remember the first time I ever saw this image, and this is just my interpretation of it. I don't know exactly why, uh, Harvin took it this way. But when I looked at it, it, it kind of reminded me of those, uh, those drawings during World War II, uh, the, the Kilroy drawings, and uh, where the, um, yeah. you know, it's just the, from the, the little drawing from the head up, you know, Kilroy was here. And uh, so I, I don't know if, if he took it like that, you know, because he, he too was in uh, World War II. I'm assuming a lot of these miners coming back, they were probably veterans as well. Maybe there was some reminiscence, I'm not sure, but that's just my, my take on this image. Clearly, it's a candid image. It's not a uh, company sanctioned image. This was purely for his um, documentation, now our documentation. So you can actually see in that man trip photograph, the, the men actually going down into the mine. Horgan and Bunnell, I don't think there's a, well, there is a, a, a Horgan photograph uh, actually that shows men in a car, um, but it's outside of the mine. <clears throat> so this photograph too is, is kind of candid as well. You have the, a group of men sitting down, uh, enjoying their lunch, taking a break. And um, it's one of the, the few images that, um, you know, actually show people sitting down, like professionally taken images, sitting down, taking, eating their lunch uh, within the mine, relaxing. Horgan and Bunnell, they, they strayed away from that kind of uh, imagery, probably because that wasn't their job. They weren't getting paid to photograph guys, you know, eating, eating their lunch. Harvin and later on Herring, they're really not getting paid to do this. They're doing this because they want to do it. So they're documenting everything. They're giving us more, uh, you know, they're, they're digging a little deeper than what uh, Bunnell and Oregon did. Now, the bottom, uh, the bottom left photo is an interesting image as well. It's uh, because of technology, you know, cameras were getting smaller. And they were more portable, obviously, during uh, Harvin's time as a photographer. And so he was able to get into smaller places. And uh, so he could get into places like coal chutes, which this picture was taken from a coal chute. So the miner uh, in the corner there, he's pushing the coal down through this, this coal chute, trying to um, unjam a, a blockage. And Harvin, you know, crawls in there and takes the photo. And that's one of the things, too, that kind of separates. Uh, so Harvin and, and Heron, you'll see, they take these uh, nearly immersive photographs from different positions and even in coal shoots that Horgan and Bunnell really kind of strayed away from, giving us, you know, another angle 
another angle of, of documentation of what it was like to actually mine coal and be a miner on a daily basis. Here are some of Harvin's later images uh, when he was taking photographs uh, of the Lands Coal operation. Lands Coal was a, an independent operation that, that operated the former Lehigh Coal Navigation's number nine mine. The uh, number nine mine today is a, uh, is, is a tourist attraction in uh, just outside of Tamaqua. And you know, a lot of these men, they worked for the Lehigh Coal Navigation Company. Some of them were laid off and then later reemployed as miners. So uh, Harvin, he, he knew them. Um, he knew them, maybe some of them more personally than, than others. Particularly the, the man in the center uh, photograph, you see him using a pick to hammer in a, uh, a beam that's being placed. That, that man, you know, his name is uh, Mike Tarzan Lucas. We have uh, the group of three miners up at the top. Uh, one of those men is identified as Mike Sabrin, who's also in the picture below, uh, climbing up the ladder. And Mike Sabrin and uh, George Harvin, they, they would remain uh, lifelong friends. So, but these are all kind of candid images. You know, Horgan and, and Bonnell, they would not, as documentation, corporate documentation for photographers, document uh, Mike Tarzan Lucas using a pickaxe to hammer in a, uh, a beam. That probably was not the proper tool to use, the proper technique to, to do that either. Um, so, but, but Harvin, Harvin was able, because he was doing this um, as, as his own uh, person, for his own personal interest, he was able to document things and tell this broader story, uh, as I said, of what mining was like in the culture of those who mined. So, um, so we have a lot of, as I said, a lot of these shots are very, very candid shots. Now, as I said, he's, Harvin is, is kind of uh, instrumental in um, grasping emotion. And you can see, you know, in these two images here, there's a uh, kind of an emotional uh, uh, sense with both of them. So the, the one on the right is titled Railroad Worker. And this photograph was taken around 1976 in, uh, in Jim Thorpe. And it, Horgan or Harvin, he won a, uh, an award for this photograph. He submitted it to Parade Magazine's 1976 uh, We the People contest. And it was a, uh, a, a well, won that, that contest. So he, because of this photograph, became an award-winning um, photographer. So you can see the emotion uh, of the railroad worker though there he's, you know, kind of looking off into the distance at something thinking, um, you know, he kind of looks maybe a little despaired and, and, and Harvin was really good, as I said, of, of capturing that human emotion, trying to you know, make you wonder what was going on with them at the time. And a lot of times he did have stories to share about his photographs. So we see the other photograph is a picture of a, of a young boy looking up at a baseball mitt with a, a robin on it. And that, that picture is, is of a boy uh, that, well, Harvin identifies as George um, Macaluso. And he lived in Nesquahone. And apparently at the beginning of the, uh, the baseball season, uh, I'm estimate, guesstimating that this photograph was taken about 1965 to 68. Um, he, he was feeling ill. So little George Macaluso here, he was feeling ill. Uh, the doctor advised him and his parents not to play baseball for several weeks. So he puts his baseball mitt up on the shelf in the, the pantry and leaves it there. One day his father asks him to, uh, you know, he's better. So his father asks him to play baseball and he goes to get his glove and finds that this robin had started building a nest. 
And while he was kind of disappointed at first, he began watching uh, this robin add to her nest, eventually lay eggs. The eggs hatched, you know, and she cared for the robins, the little chicks, and they eventually grew and, and left. And, you know, he write, Harbin writes, actually, he wrote a whole story about this. And um, he, uh, he, he's, he kind of said, you know, at the end, the Larry Macaluso, even though he was disappointed, he couldn't play baseball at first, he gradually gained more enjoyment watching and learning and, and, and seeing this uh, Robin grow. That he didn't really care if his, if his mitt was, uh, was being used and he couldn't play baseball. And so Harvin, in this photograph, you know, Harvin um, captures this curiosity from this, this boy. But Harvin, you know, himself, in documenting these anthracite mining operations and the humanistic side of those operations, kind of shows us, and this photo reflects it too, his, his own unique uh, curiosity for the human condition. And here's some of the uh, some other photographs that that Harvin had taken as well. Um, that kind of illustrates Harvin's uh, depth. And uh, I'm not going to go into to all of these these photographs right now. Some of them are kind of kind of interesting. I don't know what's up with the uh, men riding the motorcycles and uh, and the golf balls, but I, I think that's kind of a humorous photograph. So you know, while he did kind of have a um, some of his photographs are kind of artsy, kind of dark. He did have a humorous side. He did also document, um, try to come up with his own creative methods of photo photography as well. And so this image and the one below it, uh, they're actually called what he called strip prints. And what he would do is, and that, that is actually Mario Andretti, so he did get a picture of the, the race car driver. And I'm not sure about the Andretti one, but the one below it, uh, they were actually taken in the 1970s near, uh, well, at the Pocono 500 in, uh, you know, at Long Pond, uh, Pennsylvania. So <clears throat> these prints were actually, so Harbin would take a photograph, in this case of a race car, he would um, develop it and then cut it into strips and then glue those strips kind of together but overlapping each other to create this, this wave or this very blurred motion as if the, uh, the race car was going exceedingly fast and create this blurred motion. He wrote an article um, for a magazine uh, about this as well. But however, the article was was rejected. Um, so Harvin, you know, he had this this depth. He didn't just photograph miners. He didn't just photograph mining operations. But he did a lot of experimentation with his photographs. And the one on the bottom, uh, with the uh, number fifteen race car, that's actually one of the few um, color photographs from Harvin. So even though Harvin was taking photographs in the fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, and nineties he did not really like to use uh, color photography. He always felt that it kind of distorted the image. So he primarily focused on black and white. The last anthracite photographer is Scott Herring. And he, he literally is the, the last anthracite photographer. Uh, he began uh, taking photographs in 1973 when he got his uh, his first um, camera. It was kind of gifted to him. And you know, ever since then, he's been going around the region, not just a particular area of the region, but the entire anthracite region and photo documenting everything that he can uh, about the region. So he's taken pictures of uh, breakers, uh, tipples, mining operations, as they were abandoned, as they were in use, and as they've been torn down. So he has kind of added to that recordation and documentation 
And as well as uh, continuing on with Harvin, he's added to the, um, this kind of photo documentary oral history uh, of the culture as well. And here's some of the images. Uh, Scott Herring has about 90,000 uh, anthracite images. And most of them are from Pennsylvania's anthracite region, but there are uh, other smaller pockets of anthracite throughout the country. And he has some images from those anthracite regions as well. But the, the bulk of those 90,000, or actually might be more than 90,000 now, are located in Pennsylvania's anthracite region. And he does use, uh, he does switch between black and white imagery and color. And if, if you kind of think about it, you know, a lot of Bunnell, Horrigan, uh, even the photographers before, sepia tones or black and white. Harvard, even into the 90s, it's, it's black and white. We don't see mining in color. And herring, you know, starts taking these images in color. And finally, we get to see, uh, as, as outsiders, we can experience what it is, uh, you know, what the miners actually see in color in, in a mine. And um, so we get the photo down here. Over here, uh, I believe that's a, a miner, his name, uh, I think, Scott had identified him as uh, uh, Casey Crow, and he's um, you know mining, and we can actually see you know how everything is stained black from the coal, and you know black and white Harvin Horrigan, you don't see that those tones, and you you really can't see you know he's uh, he's soaking wet. It's cold. It's wet and damp down there. So. You know, by taking these images in color, it, it gives you another sense, another feel um, for how uh, these miners actually work and what they experience on a daily basis. And uh, Herring, you know, he's got stories associated with almost, if you talk to Scott Herring, he's got stories associated with most of these miners. And um, I'll, I'll just tell you a real brief story here about the lady over in the corner. And her name is uh, Nancy Wren. And her husband and son at one point in time owned uh, a small independent coal company called the Wren Coal Company. And she had a nickname, she was, she was called Queen Nancy. And she, um, she operated the the hoist. So they, the mining operation they had, it was a small independent operation. They had a, a, a limited amount of um, equipment and she operated the hoist, which was powered by an old, uh, an old truck. And she's sitting in the, uh, the cab of this old truck um, <laughs> to, to power it. And, you know, the hoist would bring up, um, you know, men and supplies and coal you know, and, and bring down, you know, the men and, and supplies as well. So a lot of times as she was waiting here uh, for them to give the signal to bring stuff up or to lower stuff down. So she kind of, you know, was waiting one day and a black bear uh, kind of moseys on over. And, um, you know, instead of being afraid of the black bear and, and scared of it, she decides to call it over to her and she had some food. So she feeds it. And eventually the black bear, she kept feeding this black bear over a couple of months and the black bear came around and, uh, you know, eventually he sort of became her pet. Well, one day, I guess there was a mine inspector who showed up on site uh, to inspect the mine and they do, you know, every month or so. So the mine inspector shows up, parks his uh, truck, walks over to Nancy and starts talking to her. And as they're talking, uh, on the other side of the cab, I guess there's a door and standing up from the door, it must have been laying down on the other side of the cab, standing up was this bear. And I guess the bear itself looks into the uh, the cab and reaches into the cab because thinks Nancy's going to feed it. Well, the mine inspector gets, uh, you know, 
uh, turns pure white and his eyes, you know, kind of pop out of his head. And supposedly, according to the story, you know, he runs away into the truck and gets in the truck and drives, drives away. And, um, you know, and everybody, everybody there is, is pretty much laughing. And um, I think uh, Nancy had some witty things to say about that, but uh, I'm not going to repeat them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but Scott, you know, with a lot of his photographs, he has these, these humanistic stories. They not only document what they're doing, but why they're doing it. And he shares these little gems, these oral history gems with us. And um, so there we have some of these, uh, some of the anthracite photographers uh, that I've mentioned. So we, we've talked about Oregon, uh, Bunnell, uh, Harvin, and, and Herring, and they collectively represent uh, about 120 years of the anthracite industry during the rise of the industry and the decline of the industry. And I think I'm done. Very good. Thank you, John. That was, yeah. that was excellent information. Some of the photos were, were new to me. Some of them were, were familiar, uh, but it's always good to, good to see some that you could, you could relate to. Um, I think I heard about Nancy from Dan Perry. I feel like Dan Perry had, had experiences with, with her and her husband and her son as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I will turn it over um, if anybody has, has questions um, very quickly. Um, or also Richard Healy, I'd like to invite you to, to chime in if, if you mm -hmm. can. Um, feel that you, you may have some of the most familiarity with some of these, some of these photos. Um, so if, if you'd like to chime in, Richard, please do. Um, or if anybody else has any questions for John. John, I have a question. Um, all of this material, is this all housed at the Anthracite Museum? Um, not, not all of it. The, uh, the um, Horgan's uh, images that he took in Mexico, they I actually scanned them from, uh, from the book that, uh, that was published. So those are not at, at the Anthracite Heritage Museum. Uh, but the, the rest of the stuff is, now Scott Herring's images, he shared with us, and the ones that I had uh, in my presentation, he shared with us for our anthracite photographers exhibit uh, that was recently done oh, about two years ago. So every, what you do have though is cataloged and indexed and do you have, or in this collection, are there photos, photos of all of the collieries, the breakers, or just a select number? Um, so during you know, Horgan, we have a lot of Horgan's photographs. There's about 1,500 of his photographs that he took while he was employed uh, as the, the DNH photographer. Um, we have about, I would say, 300 bundle photographs. So a very limited amount of bundle photographs. So not, not <clears throat> all of the uh, DLMW breakers would be... Um, and mining operations are actually represented in, in the bundle photographs. Okay. I would say most of the uh, Hudson D and H uh, mining operations are um, documented in uh, Horgan's photographs. And Horgan okay. Horgan was pretty good about labeling um, a lot of his photographs, identifying them too. Bundle I want to know. wasn't. <laughs> Oh, hi, Richard. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. I don't know, can, can you hear me all right? We can, yes, you're good. With a, with a 5,000 mile, a 3,000 mile gap. <laughs> um, just perhaps to uh, uh, add, add a comment, uh, I'll obviously uh, thank John very much indeed for a, a fascinating presentation there. Uh, but just to comment on, uh, if the labeling's correct, Barbara's uh, question there about the location of photos. Um, uh, at Steamtown, there are a large number of uh, uh, bundle photos um, because that's where the uh, the DLW uh, photograph collection now resides. Uh, uh, for many years, well, uh, they were at uh, uh, Syracuse University Library uh, uh, after Lyle Squire catalogued them in 1964. Um, 
and they were brought down to Steamtown uh, uh, some years ago uh, now, and, and uh, many, many of those have been uh, scanned, but uh, by and large, those are the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, corporate insurance breaker photos that, uh, uh, that John was, uh, was talking about. Um, so uh, uh, the only other thing I would, uh, uh, interesting comment in, uh, and, and I'll, I'll uh, mute myself. Um, I was just thinking that uh, uh, because I've been uh, coming to the coal region since 1978, um, uh, I actually have, though they're not of uh, 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 herring or uh, uh, similar quality, um, a large number of uh, colour slides of breakers now gone um, uh, that might complement some of the, uh, the images that Scott Herring took um, and I need to get on and uh, uh, scan those in amongst a thousand other uh, scanning jobs I've still to do but uh, uh, and I'll need to get copies to, to John in due course. Yeah, Barbara, if you talk to Pat McKnight, he might be able to just put a whole bunch of this stuff on a flash drive. Yeah, uh, I, I'm going to talk to Pat again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they scanned them as JPEGs, unfortunately, because of uh, the NPS did not provide enough money for hard drives. Uh, but so they're, you know, if you try to blow them up to see the detail, it's a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, they're, they're really nice. And uh, uh, John, I was going to ask you, actually, for maybe research. I know because Sarah and Marianne both have showed me a few of the Horgan photos they have in their collection. He did shoot early uh, Lorelei, hmm. which is sort of my big, my big love. You don't remember cataloging any of that, do you? Is it all anthracite that you have? Or? Um, yes, it, it's, it's all anthracite. Um, he did also photograph um, Scranton Lace uh, Company, but uh, we do not have any of those okay. images. Okay. Do you know whatever happened to the Horgan collection? Or um, I think it, since he was a corporate photographer, I think a lot of it was just kind of broken up mm -hmm. um, into different parts over the years. Yeah, early early Laureline is is very hard to find. Mm. Uh, so. Yeah. Anyone else have any other? Just, just, Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I, I said I'd be quiet, but just one other thing that has occurred to me um, when Bar Bar Barbara mentioned uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Gula mentioned. Oh, Richard, you're muted again. Yeah, we lost you. Oh, uh, sorry, just, 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 yeah. just, yeah. just to say that. Uh, um, uh, there was a mention of Pat McKnight having had to, to make JPEGs and you can't always see the detail. Um, uh, years before they were transferred uh, from Syracuse, I actually had um, 70 or 80 of these uh, photos from the original glass plate negatives uh, created as contact prints, um, which I still have. Some of them appeared in my uh, uh, book some years back. Um, but if there was a very specific thing, it is possible. Um, I only have 70 or 80 out of thousands of them um, uh, that I might have uh, a really high quality copy. Um, and if you scan these at uh, 2400 DPI, you can blow them up to the size of a wall because they're 10 by 8 glass plate negatives. Although one of the reasons they were brought from Syracuse was they were not being properly stored because they didn't have the space for them. And uh, unfortunately, some of the glass plate negatives uh, had deteriorated quite badly. Yeah. Um, uh, and that, that, that's something of a problem. But I, I managed to catch them. I must have done that 25 years ago now um, and, and, and still have. Yeah, yeah, I I was fortunate uh, when I was there for a week. Uh, Rich John was scanning, and uh, I had my scanner. I had a really good one, and so I was able to scan some of the D L N W station construction, which of course shows the Laureline in the terminal in the back. It's pretty brand new. 
four years old. And they are nice negatives. They also have some nice stuff showing Scranton Transit or Scranton Railway would have been back then, but. All right. um, Barbara, if you're looking for something specific, um, if you email us at the Historical Society, um, we could forward your questions on to John or to Richard and we'll see if we could find anything for you. Um, okay. Our email address is LackawannaHistory at gmail.org. Um, so if you need something specific, we could certainly try and help you out with that at least. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, but again, everybody, thank you very much for coming. John, thank you for your, your program. Yeah, and your thank you very you. much, John. Thank great. you, John. Yeah. Um, we will get this up on, on YouTube. Um, we're a little bit behind in our, our YouTube posting, um, but we hope to have it up in the next next two weeks or so. Um, if you join us again on, I believe it's November 18th is our, our next program. Um, in two Fridays from now, um, we have a, a woman named Devereaux Clark. Um, who will be talking about her family history um, and the Clark Brothers store in Westside. Um, we thought we'd do a, a little bit of an early Christmas shopping showcase um, with a, a historical store. Um, a little bit of the history of Scranton, some of her family focused specifically on the Clark Brothers store. Um, so again, thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, have a good weekend. I hope it's as nice where you are as where I am. Um, have, a, have a lovely weekend and thank you again for, for joining us.